Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program Jane McLevy. She is a labor activist and author of No Short Shortcuts, Organizing for Power in the New Gilded Age. And Jane, uh, welcome to the show. We were just talking before we started to uh, record that I was saying it, it really, I guess, is the new New Gilded Age. But you were anticipating where we are today as opposed to maybe where we were uh, two weeks ago. Yeah, well, and I, I even said, first of all, it's lovely to be here. Um, it's great to be on your show. It actually always is. So um, I, I think when I wrote when I wrote the title of the book, um, it was it was it was partly because it was clear to me that we were heading back to a Gilded Age. It, it, it's been feeling right from the crash of 2008 to high rollers on Wall Street to messing with the entire economy and not caring to, you know, crashing the value of every working person's retirement plan by crashing, you know, the, by the mother mortgage crash um, that we had. It, there's like a disregard that's been palpable and rising for the masses of the workers in our country. And by the masses, I mean like 90% of people, right? There has been this, you can see in the Peter Thiels and the Jeff Bezoses, and that you can feel um, a sort of a return to a 1920s uh, style country. So to me, it's been obvious that it's coming. And sadly, I feel like I am actually, it is actually here. Oops, one sec. Um, so... So we've spoken about uh, Janice V. AFSME, um, I think, at, at least a couple of times. Um, we've been anticipating this case in some respects for uh, really the past couple of years because first version was Friedrichs, uh, similar issue at hand, and then Ant and Scalia decided to uh, leave his uh, bodily form and uh, leave uh, the ability for public sector unions to easily fund themselves, at least their, uh, what the work they were doing for uh, their members. And, uh, but uh, now we have Neil Gorsuch, uh, and we have this new case, um, Janice V. AFSME. Just, I mean, uh, like I say, I think this audience is pretty familiar with it, but just sum up what the case uh, was. And it was decided yesterday, right before uh, Kennedy um, uh, retired. But um, well, uh, just sum up the case for us. Sure. I mean, in S at the most simple level, um, I say, look at Donald Trump's tweet from yesterday about this, where he says, um, Lots of money will be taken out of the coffers of the Democratic Party. Terrific ruling. I mean, that sort of sums up what the purpose of the case was um, in his own presidential tweet. Um, but what the case did was that it said, essentially, um, if you belong to a public sector union, meaning a teacher, firefighter, uh, you know, anyone who works at any level for any form of government at the state, county, local level, you, you, you can no longer be... Um, you can no longer pay what's called an agency fee. So it's, it's Byzantine. So let me just say it this way. Since 1977, in 1977, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a case called Abood, made a decision that in the public sector, workers who work for the government would not have to pay union dues. But there was a compromise in 1977 which said, look, the truth is we have a system called exclusive representation. Um, every worker has to be represented by the union no matter what. Um, so... But there's a compromise if they feel like their political values are different than their unions, for example, like who the union endorses in political races. You know, a worker should not be forced to support the political objectives of a union if they disagree. That's 1977. Let's just say I feel like that was the golden age right about now. But anyway, back in 1977, the court ruled um, there's a formula uh, that we've all had to play with a bit. You know, there's a formula that they issued that you essentially deduct how much money goes to politics um, and advocacy work, and you come up with about 70, it, it averages about 75% of a worker's dues called an agency fee. And the agency fee, though, is something that if, we're, if there's a union in the facility, then a worker can choose not to be a member of the union, but they must pay what's called the agency fee, right? So they're paying for, like, the, the service, the representation, the benefits of collective bargaining. So that was called an agency fee, and that's been settled law, as we used to think of the law, 
formerly right. con- the former concept of settled law, which we're about to rip up entirely right now, right? But so the concept of you know that being settled law. By the way, like Roe v. Wade, like many other things that they're about to rip up. So this is just you know one of many. Um, so sorry about that. Hang That's on just right. one sec, or should I just keep talking through no, it? All right. So yeah, just keep going. Um, we know, we okay. know you're in an so, airport. That's fine. Okay. All right. So um, I thought I didn't come into this room. But anyway, so essentially that was 1977. And what they did uh, yesterday technically would sort of say that the agency fees can no longer be charged. The problem is in the way they did the ruling, there's far more dangerous. There's a lot of danger that floats around this ruling. So first of all, what was the point? The point was to facilitate, you know, the next Gilded Age, really. Um, The point was to take us back to the 1920s, to be perfectly honest. That's where they're going. Um, The Lochner era, I mean, they're taking the the goal of the people who took this lawsuit. um, This was funded principally by the Uline family. I don't know if your listeners know much about them. It's good to go Google them, right? And I tweeted yesterday, I included a good New York Times piece that gave a breakdown of the primary funders of the case. So, you know, for anyone to think this is some innocent guy who's like, didn't like his union. I mean, it's, you know, horse crap, right? This is a very strategically engineered case. Um, Friedrichs was the first round. Harris v. Quinn was the first round. It goes back to Knox v. SEIU. I mean, they have been doing to labor law what they're doing to the Voting Rights Act. And they're doing it on a parallel track, which is like every session, they engineer a case that's going to challenge some part of the Voting Rights Act, some part of affirmative action, some part of labor law. And it's been death by a thousand cuts, but some cuts are much deeper. And this cut was like to the jugular, right? So, um, so, so that's the decision that they made yesterday. But what they had to do, because public sector law is different than private sector labor law. Private sector labor law is governed by the National Labor Relations Act, the NLRA. So this did not cover private sector workers, which we know are down to about 6% of right. the you know, workforce, right? So who they, were, who they were going after, they were taking their aim at, very strategically, they were aiming at where there are still large numbers of workers and unions, at the power and financial base of the trade union movement, which is the only sector capable of advancing any kind of pushback on the billionaire class. So this is super strategic, really well thought through, really well planned, decades in the making. They've been going at it, going at it, going at it. So what's unique is that under public sector labor law in the United States, it's not governed by the NLRA. It follows a lot of the same ideas laid out in the National Relations Act, right? But public sector laws are governed state by state. So, of course, you have these, like, state rights guys just eviscerating state rights, by the way, right, at right. the same time. So they literally, these are like Mr. the Black Robes of the states' rights people, oh, except when it comes to workers' rights, right? So they throw states' rights out. They engineer the case to call it a First Amendment case so that they can create national decisions about a state's rights issue fundamentally, which is public sector labor law, which has always been governed at the state level. So they knew what they could not do was mess with unions in states like New York, California, Oregon, Washington, Massachusetts, like all New Jersey, like all of the states where unions are still strong, where we have better benefits, better where workers have better lives, where we have rent control, where you know, all, like where the climate is better for the working class. They knew that the that the that the democratic leaning states, the so-called blue states, would never gut unions in the way that the you know more conservative states did long ago, and so they had to engineer strategically engineer a case that could take what has always been a state's rights issue and make a national decision to gut the financial power of the working class in this country. And that is what they actually just did. Now, it's not the end of unions. It is not. I certainly don't believe that. But if you think about the immediate cycle, like now the 2018 elections, they just blew a hole in the financial resources available to not just unions. It's the financial resources available to the Democratic Party, in essence. Right, right. Um, because what's happening, I mean, just, just if I could, what, so what's happening, and, and my understanding is that I think maybe it was SEIU, was already pulling back uh, funding in anticipation of losing uh, a, a and, and nobody knows for sure, 
how much revenue they're going to lose because it's it's an opt in type of situation. And my understanding, it's also there. There was also uh, elements of Alito's. Um, uh, I think he is the one who wrote the opinion that will yeah. also raise the bar for the opt in process. That it's going to make it even harder than just like a a decision, but it's going to be. Um, uh, th- that much harder for uh, for people to to, I guess, a- avoid the enticement of a free rider situation. Now, let me ask you this: so, so yes, it's going to starve resources from the Democratic Party. It's going to starve resources from the uh, any of the operations of uh, of the unions, uh, and they're going to need some time to sort of like readjust and and have confidence. What, who's going to pay these fees going forward, I guess, and so that they, they can, they, they, you know, now is the time not to spend any money. It's to find out how much they're, they're going to have in terms of revenue. But, you know, let me just ask you this. I got a, um, a message from a postal worker the other day who said, you know, we, we're basically an open shop, but, we, you know, we find that uh, in the context of the way that we work, um, it's pretty hard for people to avoid paying their fair share because there's a considerable amount of pressure. How much of the future is going to be a function of that when we talk about unions? Or how much is it going to be a function of the unions reforming and changing the way that they do business? Uh, and, and, and what's what's your take on 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 both? So a couple of things. One is, yes, the postal workers. So in 2003, um, the lovely old George Bush Jr. there, W, he, he did this already to the federal workers, sort of on the heels of the Patriot Act. He, like, just snuck it in there. So most people don't understand that all federal employees were sort of forced into right to work back in 2003. So that's, you know, and that's what I mean by the death by a thousand cuts. And there's been a series of executive orders, by the way, if we have time, we should get back to that were also just issued by Trump several weeks ago that are the next devastation to the federal employees. So let's, we could come back to them. But so postal workers, right, they've been living under the system since 2003. So have all the federal workers unions. I would say a few things. One is the postal workers have very good leadership right now. So congratulations, like good job electing good, smart, progressive leadership. And that's part of the message here. Um, if you have, you know, visionary, smart, and let me use the word small, the democratic, uh, high participation, you know, trade union, you're going to survive this. The, the, you know, you're going to survive it. But it's it it, 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 somebody said, well, that's an argument to do it. No, it's not an argument to do it. Like we need good unions anyway. But but the idea, the idea that people are going it, to, it's immediate, by the way, it's immediate. Like it, it the law goes into effect immediately. There's mm-hmm. no transition period. So people, so like the, even the next human resources all over the country is going to be going crazy, like in the next week, trying to figure out, I mean, there's going to be a lot of money immediately gone. Then it's an opt-in system. So like, yes, we'll survive it. And look, the, the, the best, the best evidence that we're going to survive it, and we and we can if we do our work right, uh, continue to lead the fight back in this country, which is what labor has long done, um, is looking at West Virginia, right, and Arizona, and Oklahoma, and North Carolina, and all the states where we saw the most incredibly beautiful militant struggle this year in the streets, putting real pressure on, winning things themselves, for themselves and their families and their communities, they also live already under these rules, right? So I say to people, look, look at what happened in West Virginia. They already existed under right-to-work law. They already didn't have agency fee. They don't even really have the right to collective bargaining in the same way that people in sort of so-called democratic-leaning or blue states do. So when 34,000 workers in West Virginia decided you know, we're not going to wait for political solutions. We're just going to walk off and try and fight for our health care and fight for a raise and stop charter schools and stop privatization and everything else they did. And they won. So, like, in the happy, positive news department, we need a lot more of West Virginia. And I don't mean that kiddingly. I mean that for real. Like, the only... And just to clarify, be, when we're talking yeah. about these states, we're talking about teachers, and, and, and we've covered that. But let me... I mean... Um, uh, teachers always seem to me to be best situated to um, uh, to to leverage their labor in these circumstances because on day one, and and they've already they have already developed deep ties with the community because of the nature of their work, right? I mean. As a parent, exactly. I know I want access to my my teachers all the time, and I'm going to develop uh, you know a relationship with the the teachers of my children, and uh, that you know there, there's uh, immediately I'm an ally of theirs. 
with my sanitation worker uh, or with, you know, the guy who works on um, on fixing the street. I don't talk to those guys. I don't, you know, like may, I may say hi and this and that, but I don't have a, a personal connection. How do how do unions develop a, a similar relationship with the community that teachers have, you know, as like part of their, you know, uh, as part of their job on some level. Yeah. So um, one, you're right. Um, and by the way, postal workers, similarly, like people actually like their postal workers right. generally. They know that they know them. Um, postal workers. I mean, I don't I'm I, I'm going out on a limb here because I don't actually have a statistic in front of me. But I think the postal um, service has been one of the most impressive sources of employing African Americans and African American women in this country. So, yeah. like, there's there's a solidarity that runs deep for a lot of reasons in the postal service. Right? They see each other all the time. They've got you know sort of fixed schedules. They build relationships, and a lot of them still do know their community in the same way that you're expressing about your teacher. And certainly in in no shortcuts. Right? In my second book, I talk specifically about that there will need to be strategic sectors going forward to build a new labor movement as they're coming at us. And I say, right, I argue for several chapters, like it's going to be healthcare workers and education workers who are mostly women, a lot of people of color, and who have profoundly deep relationships organically to their communities, right? So I'm super in agreement with you that this is like where we have to go. Now, the question is, so what if they have less relationship? What do they do? What I practice as a, as a negotiator and an organizer and what I write about uh, as an author and theorist is something called whole worker theory. And by that, I mean, when I'm working with workers in a big campaign, the first thing we have to do is understand the power relationships among and between the workers at work. So that's like task one if you're an organizer, like who leads who, you know, who's the most trusted worker, um, whose opinion will other workers follow if they're nervous or scared when the boss starts, you know, bearing down on them in either a unionization drive or in a tough contract fight. Um, and, and it's essentially doing what I call power structure analysis among and between ordinary workers in the workplace. Part two of that work, to survive right now and for us to push back against the coming end of the entire New Deal, which is straight where they're going. These guys are not messing around. So let's come back to that. But like what you have to do to build more strategic relationships from all workers is you have to secondarily begin to chart. And by chart, I mean literally chart, like in one-on-one -on -one conversations, rank and file led, like I train workers to do it with each other. So they go out and they say, let's make a social survey of every single person in the community that our family is connected to, our church, our little league, our soccer club. If they're not education workers, their kids' school, their PTA. Like we systematically start to chart the social relationships that the workers themselves hold in the community, then we begin to bring the workers together across big workplaces and, you know, geography, any given, or, you know, a state, a locality, wherever I'm working, and we say, now you're going to go, and that takes a while, right? It's painstaking work to, like, begin, and eat people, it's like, a, it's a serious organizing conversation. People are like, what do you want to know, you know, where I go to, what my church is, or my synagogue, or my whatever. So, um, you know, it's, a tr it's based on a trusting relationship. And then people can really do this. And, you know, we did it again in the big 2016 campaign I was running. So and then instantly you begin to see where where does where does the worker base itself already have well-trusted, well-developed relationships in their community? So it's, a, it's actually a systematic, methodical approach to structuring and building deep relationships between workers into the community because they've already got it. So most unions just don't get this step of like, the workers identifying work. what what assets already exist in terms of relationships. Yeah. All right. So yeah. Like like they do these top down. We're going to build a labor community coalition, and it's like the union leader goes and writes a check to some community group, right. and that's so much weaker than realizing the, where it the already exists the organically. There. Yeah, I get that. In that. All right. So let me ask you this. That's the perspective I would take if I would go in and I'm working with unions and I would say, look, the first the step is let's assess. I mean, that's, you know, if someone was to come in and look at my business, that's the first thing that they would do, too. I think they would say, let's see how many hits you're getting on YouTube. Let's see how many, you know, where you're where where is the most uh, a fertile grounds for uh, opportunity to expand the side, the reach of your show. Not like I have a one size fits all for every for every show despite what they're already doing and so but what if what what is i mean what do people who are listening to this show 
who aren't involved in uh, a union, who uh, don't have uh, access to, you know, suggesting, hey, you know, even if it was even if it was amongst their union buddies, like, let's map out where we have relationships and, and put it together and take a look at the thing and and focus on building out from the existing assets we have. What do you do if you're just someone who's on the outside and you don't even, you know, have a connection to a union? What, how do you, what, is there anything that we can do to support that moment where, you know, somehow we are touched by a union or we are, you know, asked to uh, join a union on a, 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 a picket line or to engage in a protest? I mean, how do we a- apply these principles to uh, a non-union context? So um, uh, I wrote an article years ago called um, Organizing Unions from the Outside In. Um, and I want to draw a little bit on that idea of what you're speaking to. So the first is, the first thing I just want to say, because it really does affect everyone, like the way you're describing that you've got plenty of listeners who are, I mean, most workers are not union, right? So obviously most of your listeners are probably not in union either because that's, that's the country right now. So, um, uh, it, say, this ruling is absolutely going to affect every single listener listening to this. It is not, this decision was not about trade unions. This decision was about the big business billionaire class rolling back the final legs of the New Deal, by which I mean Social Security. They're closing like an office every several weeks right now. Like there's yep. so much going on in the actual news every day by the distractor in chief that people don't even understand what they are doing every day. They're like, they are getting ready. Like this, I keep saying to people, this is not a decision about unions. It's a decision about corporate power. And their aim is to have small, tiny government, small, tiny worker organizations and big billionaire corporate class businesses running this country. And they are talking about the 1920s. So I say to people like, hold on and get ready for the fight. So if you don't have a union yet, by the way, it's a hell of a time to try and build one. And I'm not kidding. Like as a reaction to this, you know, people who don't have one, there's plenty of people listening who could form one. So one, start thinking about how to do it. Secondly, um, if you were like, I was working with some pastors in Philadelphia a couple of years ago in a big campaign with nurses. And after we had built relationships through the workers themselves, there came a point when I remember going into a, a Sunday church, in this case, a black church, um, where he packs about seven, the minister packed about 7,000 a Sunday in, right? These wow. are huge places. So black church, downtown Philadelphia. And I went in, it was after we won, and, you know, the members of his congregation who were part of the union, because we built the connection that way, um, you know, he was thrilled, like, by learning that unions were somehow still robbed. I remember him telling me, like, he remembered the civil rights movement and King and sanitation workers, but, like, he hadn't met, like, modern unions, right? No surprise. So there was a moment, fast forward, we win, the members of his congregation who had built the relationship between um, themselves and their new union formation and his congregation um, asked, you know, me to come in. And I wouldn't go until the end, one, because I just was flat working 20 hour days at that point, right, trying to get the contracts done. But also um, because I feel very strongly that the relationship has to be held between the workers themselves and the community that they belong to. But so finally, you know, it's over. That's the time when I usually say, OK, let's go meet these great pastors who were, you know, coming on picket lines and speaking and preaching. And and he he, he called me up onto the um you know, like in, in front of the whole congregation and said, um, everyone who has a union should meet her at the end of this. Everyone who doesn't have a union and wants one should talk to her. She's going to be in the back of the room. And for the rest of us, we need to figure out how to talk to her to build unions and support them. And it was, you know, to like thousands of black unorganized workers in Philadelphia. So uh, people, if they're of faith, whatever your faith is, you should be going in and working with your religious leader and saying, why don't we make an announcement? Uh, that it's time to start figuring out how to support working people um, and ask everyone in the congregation to put their hands up. Like, like people can start to do the same kind of charting from the outside in is my argument. Like, how do you support a union? So if you're if you have a community of faith, you could do it the way I just described. Like, let's actively start saying it's time, just like it's going to be time to stand up and support affirmative action, women's rights, the Voting Rights Act, black people, brown people, name it, fill in the blank. They are rolling the country back as fast as they can. So I think it's up to everybody to figure out and understand and see that this attack is on our democracy. It's on the republic. It's against 
our communities. It's against the entire country if you're not in the 1%. And um, so one is form a union. Secondly, PTA, Parent Teacher Association. And, you know, if you're a parent, uh, walk into the school and say, I'm going to run for office in my PTA, and then make sure that your PTA is ready to stand there supporting your teachers, and not just the teachers, but all the education workers, right, the bus drivers, the cooks, all of them. Like, we are, it's that time, it's, it's, it is time for a level of solidarity building that we have not had in my lifetime. And it's, there's no more time to wait. The level of urgency, especially with Kennedy's announcement, like, you know, the, it, we just went to, like, fire. Like, we're at a four-alarm fire in this country, that, with the Kennedy announcement especially. Um, and what they did to unions and what they did, you know, you can purge voting lists. You, can, you know, I mean, we are, we are it's going to require a level of solidarity building and people deciding they're going to do one less fun thing, you know, with the kids because they're going to bring the kids to an action. They're going to do one less. Like, we're at the moment where we're about to lose um, – the entire New Deal, and most good things that came after the New Deal, unless and until uh, people stand up in numbers that we haven't seen. And I'm not talking about going to the next protest. Like, that is not what I'm talking about, right? Like, go to the next protest, that's fine. That is not how change is going to happen in this country. Um, People have to walk into their parishes, their congregations, their synagogues, their PTAs, their community group, their soccer club, and start talking about, we need to support workers, we need to support unions, we need to actually be ready to stand up and act in our communities to defend each other. And that's already been true, right, of, of right. Latinos and undocumented people. So um, we just have to sort of say they're coming, they're coming to build internment camps. They're coming to roll us back to the 1920s. Um, it's within everybody's power to start deciding locally in their communities how we're going to build community-based solidarity among and between people in our community and among and between the working class at the workplace. Jane McAlevey, um no Shortcuts, Organizing for Power in the New Gilded Age. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Take care. Thank you. Hey, folks, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and check out our daily show. We do it every day at 12 p.m. Eastern for about two and a half hours. We even take phone calls. You should check that out.